Good afternoon. This is the work session for Marion City Council, Tuesday, July 7th. It is now 4 p.m. Uh, first, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a discussion with Parks for a resolution accepting bids awarding a contract. Sir. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I highlighted number three on the council uh, agenda. It's a new contract um, for uh, insecticide applications of significant ash trees. Uh, the first round of applications that we'll be doing uh, will be uh, approximately 74 uh, park ash trees. Um, and I just wanted to see if the council had any questions regarding uh, this contract and, uh, and ash tree uh, insecticide treatments that we'll be doing. Well, it it, it said something like, seven, is it $7 an inch? It's six, uh, on the contract that we had, uh, True Green was a low bidder, and it's uh, 650 a diameter inch, and that uh, contract price will be good for both 2015 and 2016. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Okay, thank you. I do have a question about number two. Uh, remind me again, what is Confluence for Professional Services? What is this, please? That's for the Park System Master Plan process that we uh, started in April. Okay, well, every time I see something that says paid for and the date is in the future, I always worry about those. Uh, it's about a nine-month project that we started that basically we're building out a new master plan for the entire park system, uh, and this is just a uh, partial payment for that project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Engineering, please. Thank you. Since we have several items, I'll try to get through these quickly, but uh, stop me if you have some questions that might need to get an answer for as I move through them. I will start with item number two, which is the uh, amending chapter 157 of the Code of Ordinances for the Stormwater Utility. This basically uh, provides for us to amend our fees to become comparable with the city of Cedar Rapids as far as our monthly and as our uh, maximum. It takes the $1.55 ERU and the $3.25 service fee up to $1.59 a month and $3.33 a month. This would also include um, raising the maximum per parcel to $156.80 from $133.71. This would basically affect about 13 parcels throughout the city. Uh, we're doing this, uh, this would provide for, it brings us into compliance or consistency with Cedar Rapids, but it also provides additional funding for projects. The, they're always underfunded and we, there's a reason, I mean, there's a good reason to raise them, but also the fact that it keeps us in compliance with them. Our original recommendation from the committee were actually higher than Cedar Rapids fees, and those were all lowered at the time to be consistent with Cedar Rapids. Questions on that? The ordinance would also provide for uh, the addition of a rebate program for rain gardens, rain barrels, and lawn soil improvement rebates. Uh, these were all budgeted as well as the fee increases, which what we're recommending is lower than what was budgeted by council for this year's fees. Any other questions on that? Okay. Then we'll move on down to number four, which is the concurrence of a contract with uh, uh, Prestwick LLCC, LLC actually, uh, 29th Avenue widening project. This is, uh, council approved an MOA with Prestwick back in March uh, to build the north half of 29th Avenue from Butterfield Park East over to 44th Street. Uh, the estimate uh, that we thought uh, would be the cost for the project was around uh, $511,000. Uh, through the MOA, uh, Prestwick was able to get 
quotes from contractors at four hundred fifty six thousand one hundred seventeen dollars uh, below market value and we are recommending approval of that concurrence with that contract that the contract would be between Prestwick and the contractor and they would provide that construction and then we would reimburse for our portion of the project that would complete the whole I mean there wouldn't be anything left to widen uh, they'll take us over to 44th there's still a section east of 44th the Morris property that will not be done yet questions on that uh, we'll jump down next to the 2015 sidewalk assessment project. Uh, we will have a public hearing on Thursday for accepting the bids and awarding the contract to Midwest Concrete. Uh, we did on June 23rd receive five sealed bids from 79,387.30 up to $104,890.20. Uh, the low bid uh, from Midwest Concrete of 79,387.30. Uh, we are recommending that uh, rec that that would be awarded to Midwest. Uh, work shall commit, commence no later than August 3rd and be done within 40 working days. It was that was a ninety thousand dollar budget, correct? Pardon? That was a ninety thousand dollar budget, correct? Yes. And I know the sidewalk committee had said to do as much as possible on 27th coming south on the north side of town. Is it possible to extend that further, or is that? We could ask the contractor, he may be willing to do that. The problem with that is that with an assessment project, we'd have to go through any additional work that was done to be assessed, we'd have to start over with the project. Okay, and that was my concern. Does that dollar amount roll over to next year's budget for that program then? Yes, more or Thank less. You. What percentage of that is assessed? Is what? Is there, is there a certain percentage that's assessed of the uh, 50%. 50% is yeah. assessed to the... And that is on 27th Street, so. Yep. We, uh, we assess 50% of the sidewalk and we also pick up all the driveway improvements and so forth, retaining walls and everything that is extraneous to the actual sidewalk construction that's required to do the work. So, so that's this just is been our policy. This 79,000 is the city's portion of the project then or is that? That's the entire project, the I would probably say you're going to assess I could get that number, but I'm guessing under 30,000 of that's probably going to be assessed. Okay. okay. What, what's mobilization on the bid there? Do they, that's the cheapest of, I mean, all the others are eight, nine thousand, ten thousand, and theirs is three thousand. What is that? Well, mobilization is supposed to be the cost of bringing your equipment onto site and to leave the site when you're done. Um, it doesn't tend to be that anymore. It tends to be either uh, someplace that they put profit uh, or that they can, um, it's a fixed fee so that they can, if we have 100 units of something and we only build 99, they're only going to get paid for 99. So they can't be assured that they're going to get that 100. So as a fixed unit price of mobilization, a lot of times they'll put money in there knowing that they're going to get that amount. Oh, okay. It, it, it doesn't really, really represent what it used to anymore. It just kind of sticks out, stuck out when I was looking at that, that theirs was way cheaper than everyone yeah. else's, so. Yep. And they're coming, I think, from Piasta, so they do have mobilization costs, but they're mixing it into their other costs. Well, that says to me they're after the work then. If they, you know, they make that lower, you know, they take out that. Yeah, well, obviously with their low bid that they um, obviously want the work. A lot of times with mobilization, they'll push the costs over into their unit items, but in this case, it doesn't look like they did. Mm -hmm. Thanks. The next item is the Highway 151 13th Signal Advanced Warning Device uh, Project, Project Calendar. Um, this item, as you know, we went to the DOT asking for uh, the ins installation of these devices throughout the corridor out there. Uh, DOT did only approve uh, the one location at Highway 100. So we will put these advanced, uh, basically, flashers that come on prior to the, count the signal changing to red so that the traffic can have a better understanding of when the light is going to turn. We will have them on the south, north, and east leg, the Seacrest leg, um, so that those traffic, uh, approaching traffic, can be aware of that ch signal change. Uh, we are estimating that to be under 30,000. The uh, 
project will be uh, let on 28th of July. Work shall start no later than September 28th and be done in 10 working days. It's a pretty simple project. It's just a matter of getting it done. Um, so questions on that? I'll move right along. So the, what is it, the south side where they're putting the tunnel under it? They're not going to dig the cables up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, currently, we have some fiber in the way out there that we're working around uh, on the on the underpass, so that's being taken care of. Okay. I can just see them cut through it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next item is the uh, adoption of the Indian Creek Watershed Management Plan. I think Steve's here. Uh, to maybe speak a little bit. We'll have Jennifer come up a little bit later. Yes, okay. But Steve, I don't know if you had any kind of history or... Just a quick intro because Jennifer's got the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, for the last two and a half years, several organizations, both within the Indy Creek watershed, such as Cedar Rapids, Marion, Hiawatha, and outside of it, statewide organizations, the Iowa DNR and the Corps of Engineers, have been working together to analyze what's going on in the Indy Creek watershed for water quantity, water quality, see what's going on with flooding, with nitrates and phosphorus in the, so in the water, seeing what we can do to improve water conditions within the watershed. So that plan was developed and it's put together, uh, it was finished on June 30th. It is at the printers right now, so we don't actually have the physical document because it just got done uh, last week. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal, and it's something that we will we'll have several copies of the plan here at the City of Marion. We're going to be using it to guide development and make sure that we are uh, in compliance with DNR standards and EPA standards and water quality standards. And Jennifer Fensel is with EC COG. She's the Environmental Services Director, and she's going to be giving you a more formal presentation of what this plan entails. So unless you have any questions, I will refer to her. The intent is to adopt that and then follow those guidelines for uh, how we treat our watersheds uh, in the future. So, so um, maybe it's not related, but the functions and fitness that's going to go into the, was it the 500-year floodplain? Uh, is that, will this look into that? No, well, it kind of does and it kind of doesn't. The watershed looks at our permit and how we address the needs of our permit as far as uh, sedimentation, um, things like that. That's really the only thing that would affect the function and fitness uh, addition is that they are required to retain um, all of their sediment, their wash, you know, and so forth on that site. Uh, the other, the, the, if you've had a chance to look at the, um, the watershed manual, it's it addresses a lot of things as far as soil types and change of, of our topography over the last hundreds of years. Um, there's a lot of different things in there. Uh, it doesn't really directly address uh, construction sites and development sites. It, well, she'll, uh, Jennifer will be more specific on that, but it, it's really about uh, a general overall of what we do and make sure that we enforce our NPDES permit. I guess the reason I ask that is that I know you had put out in one of your engineering uh, weekly statuses that that line had moved up slightly, and I wondered if th when this came out, did that move that line? No. Um, the, the policy will not change what council has as far as policies as far as the floodplain and how we use that. Mm -hmm. um, we did modify the floodplains. We didn't. FEMA did in 2010, and we adopted those as a city, which did change those floodplain locations. Okay. It wasn't this. No, it would not be this. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I didn't know you could write a hundred and something pages on on Indian Creek. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about two thirds of the way through it, so uh, working on it. <laughs> Okay, the next item is item 15, which is no parking on both sides of Prairie Ridge Avenue. This actually got shortened a little bit. The uh, actual location is on Prairie Ridge Avenue, but just from Hill Drive to Highway 13. I did have a call from a resident west of Hill Drive that was a little concerned about this, and uh, this was my fault that I didn't get the full description into the agenda. The resolution will be showing uh, just that segment. Uh, there's some multi-use going in north of, of um, 
Prairie Ridge Avenue that we think will cause some confusion and conflict between the residences and that multi-use property. So we're moving ahead of the construction and getting the no parking put in so that it's a little easier to establish it now as compared to after people move in. Are, are those apartments going in there or what, what's going in? Uh, it's multi-use. I think it's commercial and apartments, isn't it, Tom? Pardon me? The, the, yeah, from Prairie Ridge up to 29th Avenue, the south half is all residential, I think, but the north half is, is mixed use of both um, commercial on the lower level and residential in the top. Okay. So we'll, we will we'll be uh, recommending that approval because that is staff initiated. Next item. Uh, is the concurrence with TAC to provide for a residential on-street parking space for the disabled. Uh, James Potter has applied for this. He does meet all of the requirements to do that. Uh, that does require a $75 application fee and a $5 annual fee that he will have to pay to maintain that. Otherwise, it will be removed. Um, TAC looked at it, and we are recommending approval of that. You now, the are. big problem was the neighbor that seemed to want to park in front of his house because he had trees and it was shaded. Uh, is, will this be taken care of? Or, or are people going to go by and maybe uh, write little tickets on this guy for parking handicap? We did, we did understand that there was other things going on there. Uh, he does meet the requirements. If the neighbor happens to have a handicap sticker, he will be able to park in this spot. It's not an individual. Uh, spot. It is a, a, a disabled spot that provides for anybody that's disabled can park in it. So it will help him in that situation, but he also has other other um, needs there besides just the parking issues. So. Well, one, one of the things, the reason that the neighbor didn't want to use his own par uh, driveway was so that his children would not have some place to play, as I recall. I think there were several. <laughs> Several issues there, but yes. Any other questions on that? But you are recommending? We are recommending it at this time because it's an annual renewal. We feel that we can kind of keep an eye on it and see if it works or not. Okay. This is actually the first one of these that I think that we have a, would be approval since we put the policy in place and the process in place, um, I want to say at least three years ago. So. Next item is uh, TAC report regarding the 35th Street. We did have a request for more signage on 35th Street between 29th Avenue and the, or 35th Avenue and the roundabout. Or no, it was 29th Avenue and 35th Avenue. Uh, there are, uh, I would say, fewer than average signs up there. We don't feel that it's uh, inadequate. I think. Public Service was going to look at it and see if maybe we could put another couple signs up there, but it's not really required based on our signage requirements. I think we uh, we are recommending that there be more enforcement up there and try to keep the speeds down. It's a pretty wide pavement and it's a straight flat location, so people tend to tend to go a little faster up there. It's 35 right in there, though. Isn't it? it is 35. That's a major arterial, so it's yeah. uh, classed in. And exactly. configure the way it's supposed to be. So, and the last item is item 19, which uh, Jennifer will be here to give you a short presentation on the uh, watershed management plan. Thank you. Good afternoon. Howdy. So while we're getting set up here. There was a sorry. There was a digital um, copy of the watershed plan within your packet uh, on the server. So if you ever want to get to it, uh, it is available there. Right. Okay. Oh great. Okay. So um, as Dan said, I'm 
Jennifer Fensel with East Central Iowa Council of Governments and the Environmental Services Director there. I've been working with the City of Marion and the other members of the Indian Creek Watershed Management Authority for the last couple of years um, and the result is this watershed management plan. So just to remind you really quick where the watershed is and who all is involved, um, the City of Marion is entirely within this watershed. The uh, creeks, Dry Creek and Squaw Creek, both feed into Indian Creek, and so that puts um, the city of Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, Robbins, and Albertette within the watershed as well. The whole watershed does fit within the county borders, which is somewhat unique. A lot of times, um, you know, watersheds will meander across uh, different boundaries. And um, there was another thing I was going to say about that. Huh? We'll move on. In any case, so this plan, and uh, if you've looked at the draft, it is still in draft form. It is still on the Indian Creek website. The uh, final version that's been formatted and, and you know, uh, thoroughly checked over is at the printers, and you will have some hard copies, and then we'll put that final version on our website too. Uh, this has been a very good and, and close collaborative process with lots of different entities involved. You'll find a full listing of that in the plan. Really the main purpose of this plan is that it compiles the existing information as well as some new data that was collected. You, you indicated how long the plan was and all of the information in there. Uh, wait till you get a load of the appendices. <laughs> you'll, really, you'll really say, oh my goodness, this is a lot of information. But what it does is it outlines the, the main issues that face the creek, and these were identified by the members when the group came together and formed, and that is water quality. We do have two, um, well, both Indian Creek and Dry Creek are listed as impaired for the on the federal um, impaired waters listing. Flooding, as I'm sure you all are all well aware, flooding is an ongoing problem in this watershed. Uh, degraded habitat, um, one of the impairments has to do with a biologic, and so the um, uh, the use, the water quality isn't up to par for the intended use, which would be, of course, wildlife. Um, and then there is an interest in uh, recreational opportunities. You've, you guys have, uh, within the city of Marion, a really nice park system and some trails along the creek, and a lot of people do utilize that. And so there's um, interest and support for that. And then just having the support by um, individuals, we hosted some open house events, and we really did, and all of the different public outreach that we did receive really, really quality um, public input and interest. So what I'm going to do now is go through these were, this is a representation of the goals and the objectives um, brought up to kind of a, a very simple and higher level that was presented to the um, participants of the open house that we had. And the numbers that you see listed, that's, that represents the votes or the priority of those who attended the water or the open house, excuse me. So far and away, water quality was the main issue of interest to the, po to the folks attending this um, event. Water quality and then closely followed by flood and flood risk and um, attempting to do something about mitigating that risk. As I said, recreation and habitat was also something that was of interest to these, uh, to the individuals. And then um, public outreach and education, which we know we're going to need to do, that probably will be step number one as we look to implement this plan is outreach and education. And then the whole uh, partnerships and policy um, the coming together of all the different groups, and I think just having the um, the communities that are involved, Cedar Rapids, Marion, Hiawatha, and Robbins, it's already been a benefit to them just in getting to know each other and in having that conversation, sort of a forced opportunity for a conversation more often. And so the map that I handed out to you is kind of a, what I consider to be the crown jewel of the plan. This takes a lot of the different watershed assessment data and layers it and compiles it into this somewhat colorful and busy map. But um, if you peel away at what we're li really looking at, um, I don't think it's too terribly complicated. On the back of the map you have are the color-coded matched um, different kinds of recommended practices that you would put into place or you, we would hope to implement 
or to have others, landowners, homeowners, businesses implement in the watershed. So all of the tan is agricultural practices. All of the blue is urban practices. Um, and then you get down to some more particulars, which you'll see the opportunity for extending or expanding buffers along the waterways. That's the yellow. That is where buffers of at least 35 feet are not met throughout the agricultural area. The urban area was not assessed for this particular piece of data. Stream corridor is the purple dashed line. So there you can see some opportunities where the stream corridor and the bank, the erosion is, is particularly bad. Um, livestock management, the b brown areas are areas where if implementing livestock management would keep some of the, um, the uh, uh, pollutants out of the waterways. And then the red areas stand out as the highly erodible lands where we would want to focus sediment control. So and just to wrap up then, what we're doing is going out and asking the um, policymakers of the member, member entities for the Watershed Management Authority to adopt the plan in the next month or two. And then the hard work begins of establishing some subcommittees. And as I said, I think education and probably ag practices will be one that we want to highlight and focus moving forward with um, early on. And then the, the work of getting down to funding opportunities and writing grants to implement portions of the plan and get some dollars coming into our watershed to help um, do the things that we have identified through this plan are uh, necessary to improve water quality and mitigate flood risk. So was that the gavel of, <laughs> I'm sorry, just kidding. Huh? So if you have any questions, I can happily answer them now if I can. Otherwise, you can contact me. The website for the Indian Creek Watershed Management Authority is also listed. That's the best place to go as soon as we have the done done version of the plan. It will be there for you to download and look at at your leisure and it will be hundreds of pages so <laughs> how do you do it's, you have a stream corridor restoration in several down at the lower part of this mm -hmm. okay. how, wh what what goes on with that okay so the data comes from a stream corridor assessment where we contracted with co college and had uh, college students conduct what we call a rascal or basically a stream a physical stream assessment they walked the waterway and noted every few, you know, 20 or so feet, the condition of the, the stream bed, the stream bank, and the corresponding land use um, just adjacent to the stream. And so those areas in purple reflect those areas where erosion appeared, bank erosion and stability appeared to be particularly um, poor and where it would be helpful to have some kind of uh, either stream bank stabilization or whenever there are projects that go through there to put back the stream bed with the riffle pool that's basically trying to create slower moving pooled areas where uh, wildlife can can have you know <coughs> exist and not just have that really fast moving water that's ero that causes the erosion. <laughs> So that's where that data comes from, and those are the kinds of practices, stabilization, and um, there are probably other uh, practices, but that's the main um, practice that would be advised there. Do you have any idea what the funding needs will be? We haven't put a dollar figure to, um, uh, if you were to implement all of the practices that we'd like to see, for example, <coughs> What I did do is ask each of the members of the Watershed Management Authority to provide a wish list. If the money was no object, what would you do? <laughs> you know, what would you do first? And so we do have that in the plan. I don't have that right in front of me, um, but I can pull some of that out and email it to you if you'd like, or I can pass it on to Steve and he can pass it on. Um, um, just just to yeah. sort of get an idea of um, what their wish list would be. And it's, it's a sizable amount of money. You know, it's made probably a couple million just in wish list sort of projects. <coughs> but the individual practices, there are a lot of things that private um, landowners, whether it's in the rural ag area or urban areas, can do on their own properties. So it, it, it's, I wouldn't say that it's going to be an all publicly funded, you know. Okay. Uh, I, that's where I think education is going to come in really 
uh, critical, letting people know what they can do. Yeah, even if we just accomplish that, right. we'll be further ahead. Exactly. Yeah. If only for that, right, right. I think it would be right. a, yeah. a big step forward. Sure. Do, do we know if the water quality changes north of the landfill and then south of the landfill? Actually, we do, and um, the water quality in s for some measures is better um, because they have some, you know, that wetland that or the ponding area that they have. They have undertaken uh, water quality testing for exactly as you say, coming, you know, the surface water coming in to the property and then leaving the property. Um, we also had Co College do some monitoring throughout the watershed and. Um, really the significant differences that you'll find in terms of water quality and the pollutants is seasonally and having to do more with the agricultural um, uh, practices, you know, processes. The, the people who live out there tell me that cell one, which is the unlined cell, mm -hmm. after rain has this yellow gooey stuff coming out of there into the creek. Now that can't be good, whatever it is. Right, I um, I did not hear any observations of that necessarily from the um, study that we did, and all I can tell you is that the data that I saw, um, it appeared for some measures that the water quality was either no worse or better, actually, from a surface water standpoint. We did not test groundwater. So how does the like the Indian Creek, the E. coli count, is that pretty low for, for a creek like this that comes uh -huh. out of agricultural? Uh, no. No? I'm afraid not. That's um, uh, what one of the impairments is. So you wouldn't want to be bathing it or jumping in it and doing I things. would not necessarily at certain times of year recommend that, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, you know, follow would up with what Paul said, it looks like the the dump up at County Home is excluded. I mean, that there's a hole right there. Uh, is that uh, no, it's actually under, most of it is red. That's where? Where Highway 13. Oh, okay. I was and too then far. you kind of just, the, where the symbol for Highway 13 is, and run your finger up, and it's kind of that block of red with a little blue there and a oh, little okay. green I around was up it. too far. Yeah. Okay. That's, it's, it mostly shows up as red, and the reason for that is obviously because it's a lot steeper. You know, it's the, the red data is really elevation. So where, wherever there is a, a higher elevation nearer to a, a more low, and that distance is relatively short, that means it's pretty steep. So that, the red is really where steepness yeah, is Yeah, I was up found. a road too far. So sediment control, and that is something that there is an ongoing thing that they um, undertake, you know, that's sort of the nature of the business. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, one, one comment on that. Um, one of the things that can happen out of that plan our development standards that would reflect the uh, direction of that plan um, when development is near Indian Creek. So for example, I'm sure one of them talks about buffer strips um, adjacent to creeks so that you get a natural buffer for 20 or 30 feet. 30, 30 or 35 is minimum. Yeah. So to stop that runoff and the erosion that would go in and to also capture any of pollutants that would be going into the creek before they get there. Um, that's, and if you recall, uh, Skogman's uh, Boyce and Meadows plat, they, they did just that. They planted it in a natural, uh, in a natural setting uh, south of uh, Boyce and Road. They have the natural areas. That, so anything that comes off the lawns, herbicides, would be kind of captured there before they go into the creek. So that's something, that's, a, that's just to take the plan and move it into a <coughs> practical purpose. That is something that can occur with that. Um, moving into my agenda, the, uh, there's really two things started, and that's the discussion on uh, 
community gardens and then uh, obviously a resolution approving the community gardens policy. I did provide the, uh, the actual uh, policy to the council in the packet. Um, and really what we're doing is just establishing a policy for the, um, uh, for future community gardens to occur on public or private property. And I think that really what we're focusing more on is the, the, the idea of having a community garden uh, on, on public property with this, but it certainly would affect if someone had private property and they wanted to have a community garden. Uh, establishes, uh, you know, what the definition of one is and then the practices. Um, I think just uh, some of the key elements of that. Um, would include having some provisions for what uh, we would look at as far as like a review process. And I think obviously what we definitely want to see is that we get a site plan uh, and a location of the garden and what's being proposed on the site, where the site is. We want to have some signage that way if people are showing up at an empty lot, cars coming and going, that we, there's, a, there's a sign that says this is a community garden, this is the entity responsible for it. The city would obviously need to enter into a hold harmless agreement in the event that it is on city property. Um, if it's on private property, we'd still want the sign and, uh, you know, an idea that there's going to be people coming and going to this property for the garden. Um, um, how, how professional does the site plan have to be? The site plan for this, we just want to see a layout. It wouldn't a, have to a, be a yeah. drawing, a hand, hand drawing, hand drawing showing where the garden's going to be on the so property, how big it's going to be, how many they're going to have raised beds, how many are going to okay. be there. So nothing that would be onerous Engineered in terms of yeah, no. costing a lot of money. Okay. No, no. Um, the, we w we'd want to, there, within the hold harmless, there would be the understanding that the garden entity would be responsible for uh, maintenance of the site, nuisance issues. Um, if there's water to the site, the garden entity would be the one that has to take care of that unless something else is worked out with the city. Um, uh, similarly to any removal of garbage. So if there is garbage collection going to go to the site, someone's going to have to pay for that unless there's an, an agreement with the city as well. So it's uh, um, throughout the policy, you'll see it kind of establishes some definitions of different things and hopefully had a chance to read through it. But really, we're just trying to get a process in place that if there's an empty lot and a desire for a community garden, that someone can approach the city, make the request, and there's a specific uh, process to be followed. The policy would be wrapped up into an application that, this, that the planning department would receive. Um, we'd work with other departments where necessary and then and bring it forward, probably as a hold harmless at this point. But at least it, at least now we'll have a, we, could, we have a policy to follow in the event someone does desire to do something like this. Um, and it's really, a lot of it has to do with what we've done with the community garden between City Hall and the library. You notice there's a sign, entity is involved. So, um, were there any questions specifically on the policy? Was that whole harmless? Is that something you have to do every year then? Or is uh, yeah, yeah, we'd want to do a, like a renewable. Um, yeah. um, and then what I, what I would see happening is that you know, if you get someone that creates a garden and then it's a big mess, you know, the idea is, well, do we really want to do that again? Are you going to be <laughs> take care of it better, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I think there was a provision it'd be renewable after, uh, I think for the first couple of years and then we could enter into an agreement for longer if we so, if the city so chooses. Um, I did want to point out that uh, um, I know it's on the agenda coming up at the next meeting, but there's, there's there are a couple people in the audience that wanted to kind of speak to the issue. I don't know if you wanted to let them speak now so they don't speak later. No, oh, just speak now. It's fine. <laughs> what are they going to speak? <laughs> what do we? Who do we have here? What's the? Let me introduce you. Okay. <laughs> you go first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Sarah Menser uh, with the Blue Zones Project, and the Uptown Garden is part of our placemaking, um, and it got us started into this: the idea of how do we do a community garden to benefit the community. So because, come on, so that um, you don't know, it's not just us. This garden did not happen without the folks that you'll hear from in just a minute who were who were involved and are currently involved in making this happen. So, Don, you come up here too because you helped us build and put up signs <laughs> and everything else. So um, Phil Fister is here. 
um, with Master Gardeners. Master Gardeners provided us a number, helped us, well, we wouldn't have been able to build the beds without the guidance from Phil and everything else with the compost and what went in it. But then he, the also uh, Master Gardeners raised the tomatoes and the peppers for us in their greenhouse out at Lau Park. And then Phil transplanted those for us and put all of the cages around them a few weeks ago. So you'll see that. And Peg is responsible for um, the Churches of Mary and Food Pantry, and they have been tending the garden for us and harvesting and then providing it through the pantry on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, during the week, and we'll continue to do that. And Ron Thatcher is one of our community members who has been active with us in putting the signs up and helping us build the beds and fill them and the plantings that went along with that. So I, they can give you a few more details or answer the questions in what we have been harvesting already. And as you can see, it's in full bloom right now, but there's more to come with um, what's in there. There are currently seven beds. We had six originally, and we ran out of room for the squash, so we had to build a seventh bed, and we planted the squash um, there, and that is growing as well. So if you want to add, Peg, like what's been happening at the pantry and your volunteers. We have had pretty good uh, early, early spring things, and now we're kind of in between waiting for the tomatoes and the peppers and the squash. We have uh, two families that volunteer on Monday night to pick for Tuesday, and we have myself and another lady that takes care of Thursday morning. And I think it's been a big hit with the food pantry. Our first planting is lettuce and spinach. Yeah, we usually put them in bags. We bag them up so they're ready to pick up and go. And we've had like 12 bags that would feed a family of four probably just once, each, each, each Tuesday and each Thursday, and some radishes and some beets. It's just been... How, and how much fresh food did you have before at the pantry? People would, people would bring in some extras that they had from their garden, just on and off, but... So not regular, though? Not regular, no. So this was just 48 bags of lettuce spinach? Right. Okay. Phil, did you have anything to add just on the putting this together and the planning? Phil put the whole planning together. Um, just to add, uh, the planning is fairly straightforward in a garden like this, but I did want to make another comment as well. As part of the Linden County Master Gardeners, we're seeing uh, significant interest in increase in interest in vegetable gardening. And this has been going on for the last few years. We see it in the questions that come across our Hort line, as well as attendance at our uh, educational events. Um, we saw such a growth in interest in community gardens that we actually last year established a community outreach garden committee of which I'm one of the members. Uh, this year we're actively engaged with five community gardens. Marion is one of them. We're providing educational support. I think um, from what I see around the communities, Marion is definitely stepping ahead of the pack in establishing a policy like this. And I think it's a great thing for your uh, members of your community, both from the ability to be able to grow uh, good, healthy food that they've grown, as well as a mental health improvement. We know that gardening helps people live longer, healthier lives, and the involvement of the children. And you get the children involved in that, and you know that they'll continue that on. So I think all around, this is really an important uh, activity. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, with that, we just want to say thank you for your help in making this happen on the current lot and letting us grow with this and, and learn. Um, we hope that that would expand in the future as we could have more groups helping um, the churches to tend those gardens and planting in those beds. And we've seen interests of even corporations that would sponsor a bed to help take care of it and provide that food. So um, with that growth, we appreciate your consideration on this resolution and what we could be doing in other parts of the community if there are interested citizens who want to do something similar. Do you have other areas targeted for gardens? Um, we do not, we haven't identified city properties that we would do. Um, it's more about what is available, if it was city land that somebody could use, and if a neighborhood group um, 
came forward and said this is right in our backyard and we'd like to start one here, could, could we use that, that, that the rules are laid out for them to say, sure, we'd love that, here's what you need to do, and get that started. From our perspective, the, um, on the Blue Zones and the Uptown Garden, we would expand on what we have there unless we had um, a private company coming forward and wanting to grow or a church on other land in the community. We have had, we have been approached from a couple of the, um, the um, apartment complexes to see if we would help start a garden, a community garden at their locations. And if we can get the volunteers together, we would love to. And now that we've done this one, we kind of have a, mm -hmm. a layout, a template of what people can do and how we can get them going. So, Any other questions? so the master, master gardeners, you guys have a classes at Lau Park, I believe, is that correct? We have, um, yes, we have classes at Lau Park. We have the, the greenhouse, which of course is a tremendous educational opportunity as well as um, serves as a facility to grow a lot of the flowers that are out the demonstration gardens and around the parks here. Um, and we plan on uh, making that facility available for education for uh, gardening uh, as well. So. They're going to have tomato tasting at the uh, Swamp Fox? Yes, Swamp Fox on the 26th of September. We have about 30 tomatoes growing in one of the demonstration gardens right, right now. I'm looking forward so to it. Pray for warm <laughs> weather. And, and Phil also helped us, and I, I will say, um, Ms. Pegg, we, there is now a garden at every Linmar Elementary School in Marion. They've all planted them. We helped each of those get going or rejuvenated. And in Marion High School, we expanded their gardens by seven beds. They had just some dirt they put on the ground and expanded that by seven beds and they are they are composting and they're turning into science experiments as well as the growth and seeing the full cycle of that and Master Gardeners has helped us with that and the growth and the knowledge of how to do um, the community gardens. In fact, Marion High School when they, um, as that gets going, she'd like to in the summer involve the neighbors and it's like a, anybody come on Wednesday, you can, as long as you work, you can pick the produce and take it home with you. So how we take those opportunities as well. On the west side by McDonald's, that island there, is that something that, that was taken care of by, um, by, a, the, by your group, or, or is that just the park? Or, that, that's under the, the contract that we have with Creekside. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. There is one thing that bothers me, and that's under um, the maintenance and upkeep under B2, at the end of the growing season, all garden beds shall be cleared and cultivated as appropriate. Uh, I know that uh, farm sites don't plow up the stuff at the end of the growing season because uh, wind and stuff would erode and, and carry away soil and all this, and so they would leave. Uh, what is the policy on this? I think, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I think what we're just trying to, to make sure the site is, is clean. I don't know that we necessarily go into a definition of cultivated, but yeah. Well, yeah. Because like you, you go by these fields and, and they've still got like corn stalks and stuff sitting there and they do all winter long yeah. because it does protect the, the soil and then plow it under in the spring and, and it. Yeah, I, I think what we're going to be looking for is that it's, it, it's leveled and taken care of because it is an urban environment and people will live around them. And you yeah. want it to be neat. Neat, yes. That's very well said. Neat. Go ahead. May I make a comment? I happened to be in a class uh, that was taught by Dr. Patrick O'Malley, who's one of our Iowa State um, resources. And the question had come up about tilling your garden in the fall. And his response was, in agriculture, we don't want, we don't recommend tilling because there is such a large expanse of ground that you lose a lot of it through emo, uh, erosion. In a small garden plot, we do recommend tilling in the fall because it brings up insects and everything and you have the birds that help reduce that population and you don't have the exposure to the wind like you do in a field. So that's kind of the difference in why you would want to clean a plot up in the fall and the benefits that you get. Sir? 
Right. Uh, the first item under administration <coughs> is a resolution of intent to um, approve the use of tax fin increment financing for the 1204 7th Avenue project. What this is, is as the council is aware, we have an agreement on that b b uh, building that has already expired. Uh, this resolution directs staff to begin the formal process for executing a successor agreement or a new one on the facility now that the project has changed. Um, the original terms of the original agreement uh, called for the construction of a 21,000 square foot three-story building. Um, the company had agreed to a minimum assessed value of $3 million and the incentive that the city was going to be provided was broken down into two pieces. There was a, for a forgivable loan or an economic development grant of 150000 and then a series of rebates of uh, $500,000 that were going to be granted over seven years and they were stepped down starting with two years at 100% two years at 80%, two years at 50%, and then the final year it was going to take about 30% of the projected taxes that would be paid on the facility in order to um, come up to a half million dollars worth of rebates. The new agreement that we would be proposing is quite a bit different than that. Um, we've worked a lot with our attorney to put together an agreement that um, really is structured in a way that we have not done one in the past. And it's something that I wanted to kind of go through in a little bit more detail with the council. Um, obviously, the construction project has changed. You're now talking about a two-story building that's 14,000 square feet, still mixed use, commercial on the main floor, residential on the second floor. Uh, minimum assessed value is unchanged at $3 million. Uh, but what we've been looking at is doing what's called a residual receipts loan rather than doing any type of a forgivable loan or uh, other type of incentive. Essentially, and one of the things that I think this has been a criticism of a lot of our TIF projects has been this idea that we're not asking for the money back. Uh, in this case, the, we would be structuring that as a direct loan um, in second position behind the bank that would be um, set up so that we would be earning more interest on it than we earn in our investments and having that money um, sitting in our accounts. Um, we would increase that amount up to $350,000 and then with a residual receipt loan what you do is you negotiate with the company for a fair rate of return for them for owning that building. In our market it seems like those numbers are anywhere between uh, 8 and 12 percent and so I'd be looking at fixing that number at 10 percent and then as the as it goes through the years and as the, the as rents go up and and uh, you see increases in that because of inflation we would actually get paid back at an accelerating rate over a period of years until our debt was retired uh, it does mean that we have to have a lot more information from the bank because it's all tailored together with the financial package that the bank is putting together for, together for the project um, what we have that the banks don't is the ability to intercept property tax payments if for some reason or another they actually default on their loan. If they default on the loan, then the rebates are null and void and we start to recapture the property tax payments to repay the loan rather than having them pay it back directly. Uh, as we've been looking at a lot of these uptown projects and the way that they're um, coming together financially, uh, it just really looks like it makes a lot more sense for us to um, not be putting money out there in the form of forgivable loans, but rather asking that if, uh, if we're going to be using taxpayer dollars to help with these projects that we ask for that back. So here it would be structured with a $350,000 residual receipts loan and then rebates of $300,000 um, coming in over a period of years. On a $3 million building, essentially that means that they would res they'd get that $300,000 point in about three and a half years based on what the minimum assessed value of the building would be. Uh, again, two years at 100 percent and then well, one year at 80 percent and then part of another year at the 80 percent level and then the forgivable loan or the rebate portion of the agreement would be taken care of. The company, and I wanted to prevent present an alternate scenario because the company has actually asked that we would do an increase in the amount of assistance that we would consider because of their cost increases that they've had associated with the building. In running the numbers on that, um, they were asking for uh, 850000 um, The only way that really works is if the minimum assessment on the building goes up to $4 million instead of $3 million. And uh, one of the things that our attorney has cautioned me on on that is that you do need to be somewhere in the realm um, of what the building would assess at 
just out there on the market. In other words, if they would normally give it a 2.8 million and your minimum assessment agreement is 3 million, there the county's probably going to be okay with that. But if you're going to be a million dollars off from what it would be otherwise, that they probably are not going to be comfortable with that. In this case, um, you'd still look at the residual receipts loan so that that portion would be the same, um, the, but the rebates would be uh, extended out and would actually take about seven years to receive that half million dollars um, if we were going to use the company's proposal. So the resolution of intent directs the staff to um, start the process of putting this development agreement in place and just needed to see where the council was at on that if you have additional questions or concerns. Um, certainly I think with this development agreement we would be very specific about a construction schedule, milestones, deadlines for when everything is expected to be completed. Um, but we've tried to address it in a way that makes sure that the project can get constructed um, but still also protect the interests of the community and wanting to make sure that it's completed in a timely manner. We'd be in second position behind the mortgage, Elon. We would. We'd be ahead of any liens of any kind. Yeah. And the, the really the trump card that the community has that a bank doesn't is the ability to assess. Uh, if they default on the loan, um, one of the things that our attorney is taking a look at is um, like we commonly do with a lot of our other projects is a waiver of assessment, meaning that basically they consent that if there's a default or something uh, or if they don't make a payment that we can assess that cost right back to the building and then it's collected in the same manner as property taxes. You know, banks can get to that point by getting a judgment, but it takes them a long time to get there. That will be in the agreement. That's something that uh, our attorney is taking a look at now. I We've always have the ability to do it, but you have to go through the formal assessment process where you set a public hearing and then go through everything else. If you do it through a waiver, none of that is required and you can just move immediately into action for doing the what assessment. What you're saying is they would waive their right to object to an assessment. Mm -hmm. They would consent to the assessment in this agreement and waive their right to object to it. Yeah, it's not in the draft that they currently have, but it's something that uh, our attorney is taking. Part of every at. agreement. I mean, based on how these projects have gone, I think it should be part of every agreement. Mm -hmm. How does a building go from three stories to two stories and still be the same assessed value? The, um, there's a couple of things associated with it. One of the things that the county takes a look at when they're assessing the value of the building is its occupancy rate. For example, uh, PDS Investments has a minimum assessment of 2.9 million for their facility, but because they're only two-thirds leased, right now their tax assessment is at 1.9 million. When that building is completely leased out, the assessment will be changed because they're using kind of an income-based model it depends for it. On the, on, the, on the approach you use for valuation. Mm -hmm. whether it's replacement cost, or so they're not using replacement cost, they're using right. income. Yeah, at least in that facility, in the case of Lincoln View, they're using an income-based approach to determine value. And in any event, the agreement fixes the amount of that minimum assessment. I mean, the, essentially, they're agreeing to be taxed at that rate going forward. Okay, so, so I understand in this new proposal there's no um, there's no forgivable uh, forgivable forgivable component right it's just yeah. a loan it's a it's a loan um, that the city would be paid back for uh, again using the res there's two ways that you can do it you can do a deferred loan where something like they might pay interest only over a period of years and then you expect them to balloon it at a certain point in time um, but with a residual receipts loan essentially they're agreeing that we, this is our profit margin that we expect to get off of that building and then anything else that it makes above that will go towards servicing your loan the, the entire loan gets paid back. Mm -hmm. And then when you talk with about interest, when you talk about rebates, what is that? What's the rebates are separate. The rebates would be a tax payment that would be made. That's um, a separate component. As a of separate the component, right? So, so the be. total incentive package, the original incentive package was six hundred and fifty thousand, with one hundred and fifty thousand forgivable loan or a grant, and then 500000 in rebates. This one would be 350000 but a direct loan where we're being paid back, and then 300000 in rebates. So still the same amount? 
Yeah, as, per, as the uh, draft agreement is contained, it's the same amount. Said the company had proposed and asked if uh, we would be willing to do more. Um, that's really a decision for the council. That's not something that I can make a decision on. We will discuss that next meeting. Is that what, yeah, is this, that what that's about? The, this is just the uh, approval of the resolution of intent. So, yeah, hmm. we can discuss that on the next meeting. When right. That would be up for consideration. All right. Or at the 515 session. Okay, okay. so. Okay. So, the I mean, oh, at the 515 meeting, we'll, there'll be discussion on this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm hmm. Uh, number two is a resolution to approve partial payment number two to Capital Commercial for uh, renovations at 1007 or at 1007th Avenue. It's the Owen Block building or the Made Right building, however you intend to uh, refer to it. The um, development agreement that we have with them stipulates that we would make a series of payments to them based on um, financial milestones and investment milestones being reached on the facility. Uh, I've been communicating with their bank and the number that they had certified to me with um, of expenses was uh, two million and eighty eight thousand which would qualify them for uh, the next three hundred thousand dollars in economic development incentive payments um, with this agreement there are a couple of additional considerations uh, one would be that um, the agreement does stipulate that the uh, Renovations undertaken have to be in conformance with the standards that would allow the building to um, receive a historic pres preservation tax credit award. It does not stipulate that they have to receive one because those are competitive, but that the uh, renovations undertaken that are true to the character of the building and meet those necessary standards. Um, Has that been met in your in your Estimation. My understanding is that they have submitted for the first phase of that. There are at least three phases with getting um, a historic preservation tax credit award. Uh, the first one is just documentation that the building is eligible to receive that. After you receive that, then you have to start working through and negotiating the actual improvements that you're going to make. And then the final, uh, the third phase is to go in and provide all your documentation, verification of costs and everything to get the, f to finalize the actual tax credit award. So what you're saying is there really has effectively been nothing done towards actual construction of historical credibility? They have done the first phase has been submitted. Uh, you know, Timeline-wise, that is not something that I am an expert on, so I don't know how long it takes to have that turned around. You but if I understand the first phase is just submitting that the building is eligible documentation that the that the building is and certification that the building is eligible did you say they've already spent two million dollars the number that the bank had certified to me was uh, two million eighty eight thousand they're going to be sending the receipts and everything to document that And per the agreement, um, they were to invest a minimum of $2.1 in that, and the building will have a minimum taxable value of $1.3 after the renovations. So what's left to be done, or could, do, is this part of the discussion at the meeting? What's left to be done? Duck pointing, I think, is a big item. Yeah, and from the outside, it really does not look like restoration. Well, there are a lot of things that um, you can't do to the building until you get the um, certification on the Historic Preservation Tax Credit Award. Uh, the company, for example, um, was in their initial plan showed the council pictures of moving the door back over to the corner instead of having it come out where it does right now and restoring the cornice at the top of that building. That kind of work cannot commence until you get the sign off um, that they meet the standards for this pr historic preservation tax credit. If you start that kind of work right now and they come back and tell you, oh, you did it wrong or you used the wrong materials, it can render that part of the project ineligible. So all of that has to take place and that has to be worked out before you can start that kind of work. What's our assurance it's going to get done? 
correctly. Yeah, I mean, the essentially with this one again, the assistance that the city is providing is in the form of a forgivable loan. If we provide the assistance and uh, the company gets down to the end and they have not met the, his the standards for historic preservation tax credit award, um, they're in default of the loan and we proceed with collection activities. Again, you know, it's a breach of a contract. You can come after it contractually, but as I've stated before, the city has the ability to do an assessment to recover those costs. But um, there's no waiver of assessment in this agreement. No, there is not. Oh, there's a waiver of objection. Mm -hmm. Very well. Number five? Yeah, number five, uh, the Local Option Sales Tax Committee at their June meeting uh, examined a request from the staff to uh, determine whether or not using local option sales tax funds for a market analysis for a hotel motel for Marion was consistent with the ballot language. Uh, the committee concurred that that would be an appropriate use of the uh, the. Uh, community investment or the community purpose dollars, the 30%, and had authorized up to 25000 to be used for that purpose. Um, this is out of the uh, extended local option sales tax. It does have uh, broader language as far as the usage of the 30% than the original local option sales tax did. This is tied in with number six. Um, we had put together a request for qualifications for firms that was published and it was also distributed directly to firms across the Midwest that had been identified as having the capability to um, do this type of a study. Uh, Hospitality, Market Hospitality Marketers International was the only one to submit a response to that request. Um, they are within budget at $16,500. Uh, I think one of the things that um, may have scared off some of the other firms is that the study has a pretty aggressive timeline on it as far as needing to get it completed in no more than about 10 weeks. So uh, that may have caused some of the other firms to balk at it a little bit. But uh, HMI um, works for many of the major hotel chains across the country. Um, the way that they're actually proposing to do the analysis would be to provide the information that we're looking at, um, both for a, an existing conditions and then also a post prospect meadows analysis so that we have an idea of what we might be looking at for needs for additional hotel development. Uh, and then the way that they structure their studies, if a hotel chain comes in, particularly if it's one of their clients, um, they said that they always do commission supplemental studies on their own behalf. They could take our data, and if they choose to use uh, HMI, they can move right into that next phase and get that done very, very quickly. Doesn't a hotel chain do this on their own? To, to they do, but um, when they do it, it's proprietary and they won't release that um, for use for a community to market for to competitors, essentially, for example. And uh, in our case, one of the things that we're wanting to do is to see that before and after impact from Prospect Meadows. Uh, in the case of uh, where you've got a major tourism project like that coming in, the hotels are only going to look at your existing conditions, and we really need the opportunity to plan for it. If we're going to have a demand for three hotels, hotels show up in a couple of years, we need to start identifying sites and making sure that our zoning districts are set up uh, to be hosp to, make, to work for the hospitality industry. Well, does this committee uh, determine the capacity of the hotels and uh, what uh, what the potential is and then what the actual is? What do you mean? Well, okay, say a hotel has a thousand rooms but only 250 of them are filled at any given time. Uh, is this going to show up on the study? Yeah, it will. They'll take a look at um, not only Marion, but because we're part of a larger metro market, they'll have to take a look at uh, occupancy rates and vacancy rates uh, along across the entire metro to see how we are for rooms. They'll look specifically at the Marion market and what we might be losing from uh, the current market because we don't have a facility in town that could necessarily hold larger groups. Um, 
They will also make recommendations based on your demographics, um, what kind of a price point and type of a hotel you will should be looking at. Well, will this include like all the Cedar Rapids or just like the eastern part? So it would be like Blairs Ferry and Collins and that. For the, uh, for the Prospect Meadows portion, they'll actually be taking a look at broader than the Cedar Rapids area. They'll have to include Anamosa and really about a half an hour out um, all the way may maybe even down to Coralville uh, because oh. of the impact that it'll have. But when you look at Prospect Meadows, uh, what is the uh, time period as far as uh, filling up hotels? With that, I mean that's that's a summer pastime unless they're going to enclose them all in, under domes. They do have thoughts of future phases of doing things, uh, in, uh, building buildings to do things inside, but that wouldn't come with the initial build out. Uh, the question becomes is you know if Prospect Meadows um, is is hosting 12 to 16 tournaments every year on behalf of Perfect Game, which is what Perfect Game has committed to. Each one of those tournaments is going to draw in, depending on how many fields are using, between three and 8,000 people. And what's unusual about this type of a thing, rather than a concert or an event like, uh, or an event, you know, even the Swamp Fox, those generally are only one night. Um, with these type of tournaments, they're typically four or five nights. And so you start to layer that on top of everything else that's happening in the metro area. Um, I don't think we're going to have the hotel rooms across the entire metro that would be needed to accommodate that. The question on Marion right now is really um, where are we at relative to where we should be for the size of the market that we've got. Um, if you look at some of our peer communities, um, you know, Bettendorf, uh, even West Des Moines, um, West Des Moines has almost as many hotels and hotel rooms as Des Moines does. And uh, Bettendorf brings in over a million dollars a year off of their hotel motel tax, and we're at only one-fifth of that. You know, we've grown um, by 50% in the last 20, 25 years, and we've added one 36-room hotel. So what we don't really have a handle on is whether... Um, I don't think, in my mind, there's not necessarily a question over whether a, another hotel would be justified in Marion, but I can't tell anybody how big it should be, how many rooms it should have, what they should cost, what the mix of rooms should be with, you know, um, regular rooms, should you have an extended stay wing, all, the, all those types of questions are the things that this consultant would answer. Well, I got involved with um, these baseball tournaments at another location. Anyway, uh, the big thing with that was uh, there were so many people that would come in their campers and they wouldn't use hotel, mo you know, motel. It would, they'd camp because it was cheaper. So yeah, that's does that get taken into account too? It does. They'll take a look at the bleed and how many people would just um, rather stay elsewhere with those types of, of uh, events. Um, but they have a pretty good handle on how people are going to behave when they come to these from ones that have happened in other locations around the country. Okay, thank this you. Is recommended. This is recommended by the Lost Committee. The Lost there. Committee um, took a look at to make sure that the use of the lost dollars was an appropriate use, that this was project was an appropriate use of the lost dollars and concurred that they were. And then they said that we could have a budget for this project of up to 25000 There's really a series of three studies that Marion needs to do to establish our market. Um, there's this one. There's a a housing study that we need to do, and then also a business gap analysis. Uh, all of those will play into our long-term zoning decisions and land use planning recommendations that we'll be making and looking at with the update to the zoning ordinance. But it's really kind of establishing, you know, what is our market? really at a level of detail that we haven't had before. There are companies that will do this kind of stuff for you, but the problem, as I cited, is before is that it's proprietary data. They don't want to share it. And, you know, they'll come in and they'll tell you this is what we think we need um, and what the market will support. This is what we're willing to build. But you don't know how much of a gap is left. I'd also point out that the, the one state of housing needs assessment, um, if you'll recall, Probably about 10 years ago, the city was active in like weatherization programs at the state where we where we received financing from the state to help um, with uh, lower income folks um, and seniors do weatherization in their homes. I think we we I think we did up to probably 30 to 40 homes in the late uh, 2000s um, with state dollars. And you have to, you have to have an updated. Um, 
<coughs> housing needs assessment to apply for those dollars. So that's that's something, I, and I think we are out of date on our current one. So that's just something that's good to have. Um, in the event that we want to proceed with those kind of dollars, you have to have it up to date. I think it's got to be done every like five years. So just another reason to think through uh, proceeding with the housing one as well. That's all I had for the work session. Very well, thank you. Oh. Mayor, I noticed that um, the uh, closed session regarding my evaluation was on this agenda. Um, I would suggest maybe going ahead and um, ha doing the motion and getting Don's opinion to enter into that, but then recess from it. We'll conduct the formal council meeting and then go back into that. Okay. Uh, it does say after Tuesday at 5.15, so I think we're good. Yeah, I'll I didn't notice to, that. Uh, adjourn to a closed session for uh, uh, under Section 21-5 of the Code of Iowa. Second. Motion is made and second, sir. Before you vote, let me give you my opinion, and I've reviewed the subject matter, and it's appropriate under state law. Roll call vote. Ms. Pazor? Yes. Ms. Etzel? Mr. Spink? Yes. Mayor Buska. Yes. Mr. Crawford. Yes. Mr. Abawasley. Sure. Mr. Draper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. We adjourn. Now we're going to. The way that that was published, it does say that it'll take place Tuesday after the 515 meeting. So we're free to go ahead and, and uh, start the 515 meeting, and then we'll convene into that afterwards. And you're good. good. Very well. <laughs> so now we now we have a regular meeting, sir. Correct? Good afternoon. This is the Marion Council regular council meeting. It is Tuesday, July 7th. It is now 516. And uh, we shall now have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And you'll sit there as Correct. Roll call, please. Ms. Pizor. Here. Ms. Etzel, present. Mr. Spink. Present. Mayor Buska. Present. Mr. Crawford. Present. Mr. Abawasley. Here. Mr. Draper. Here. Mr. Draper, would you like to do the moment of silence, please? Thank you. Thank you. Do, at this time, uh, we are doing things a little different here. This is a Thursday meeting on a Tuesday, but do we have any citizens to, to make a presentation or anything that is not on tonight's agenda? Is there anything out there, sir? You may step forward. Thank you. A name and address, uh, please. Dwight Hogan, 1565 7th Avenue. Just have a comment. Saturday was our nation's birthday, and yet there were no flags flying on 7th Avenue or 6th Avenue, and I'm kind of disappointed in it. Our city should have had some flags out. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we shall now go to the consent calendar, Councilman Smith. Yes, Your Honor. Is there any uh, items on the consent calendar to be pulled for special consideration? None. Your Honor, I move to approve the consent calendar, items one through 
31, which includes resolution 24,677 through 24,687. Motion is made, missed one, 688. Motion is made and second for the, the complete uh, consent calendar. Uh, do we have any discussion? Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Moving along to Councilman Crawford. Yes, this is a motion to approve the consent calendar with Council Member Abu Asli abstention as presented, numbers 35 through 39, including resolutions number 24691 through resolution number 24696. Second. Motion is made and second uh, for the, pro for the uh, consent calendar uh, discussion. Those in favor of this, can I, can go I ahead, sir, go ahead. The, the uh, number 37, uh, that's a, a very nice thing that the city is receiving uh, from uh, Mr. Morris. So a donating of uh, seven point, almost seven and a half acres uh, to the city. So thank you, Mr. Morris, for having some more land for us to uh, have parks and everything. That's all. I, I would like to mention, I asked engineering last week, and they did go out, and they do have two stakes where the drive will be going back to all those rock parks so you can recognize how you'll be able to get there. Can't drive on it yet, but at least we'll know where the roadway is. Thank you. Um, any other discussion? For those in favor of approving this consent calendar, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? With one abstention. And moving to engineering, Councilman Nick. Mr. Mayor, I move uh, to approve ordinance number 15-18, amending chapter 157 of the Code of Ordinances related to stormwater utility. Initial consideration. Second. Motion is made and second for ordinance 15-18. Uh, uh, discussion? Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Councilman Draper. Yes, Your Honor. Motion to receive and file and adopt the Indian Creek Watershed Management Plan. Second. Motion is made and second to receive and file the Indian Creek Watershed Management Plan. Discussion? Now, this hasn't been actually received yet, has it? The draft version is. But, I mean, it, it isn't. We don't have the hard copy of the full version. Yet, Thank you. Or should this say the draft of that? <laughs> All those in favor of this motion to receive and file, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, Councilman Pizzola. Your Honor, I move to approve resolution 24,697, establishing a community garden policy for the city of Marion. Second. Motion is made and second for resolution 24697, discussion. Hearing none, those in favor of resolution 24697, signify by saying aye. 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 Those, op those opposed? Councilman Etzel. Ordinance number 15-16, amending the Marion Code of Ordinances to rezone properties located between the intersection of Winslow Road, Indian Creek Road, and Silver Oak Trail, west of the roundabout at Lucor Road and Tower Terrace Road from un undesignated to R1, low-density single-family residential, and from R2, medium-density single-family residential to R1, Low density single family residential city initiated final consideration. Second. second. Motion is made and seconded for ordinance 15 16. Discussion. Well, why is there R1s and R2s mixed in there, Tom? Well, if you recall, the, the this area is along 10th Street and there were some larger lots uh, like uh, Mr. Schlegel's property on the corner of Tower Terrace. He's actually A1. Um, anything over a couple acres we went with, or anything um, um, that was larger went R1, and then there were some smaller areas of the R2. So, so, so it's, I mean, it's going to be a mix of large lots and small lots, and or yeah, but you're talking about over a 40 some acre area, so it's yeah, yeah. Yep. And uh, so that's okay to to develop it out that way. Yeah. 
and usually you see big lots and smaller lots, but this is going to be a mix in, in amongst each other then? Yeah. yeah. There should have been, I mean, I can, I don't have the, I don't think I have the exact map on it on the third oh. reading. I could probably find it, but in the packet it explained it. And you'll see, yeah, when you I look at it on the map, it, it makes sense. And, but that was my question is, is that typically yep. you have big lots and small lots and, you know, the, the but what you're saying is maybe a, you know, a couple of acres next to a half acre. Or yeah, and they all exist. And these are pre, they're, they're pre-existing properties. So, yeah, if you take a large lot and you zone it R, uh, zone it R2, mm -hmm. you would have the ability to split it even more. And I think the character of the neighborhood is you want to preserve what's out there in this instance. Okay. So if they did want to change it, they could come back in. But I, I think in this instance, it's kind of pretty much built out the way it would be. Okay. Yep. Just want to make sure that's what you're talking about. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> any, other, now. <laughs> any other discussion? <laughs> For ordinance 15-16, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Councilman Steele. Yes, Your Honor. I move to approve ordinance number 15-17, amending the Marion Code of Ordinances to zone property located on both sides of North 10th Street between Tower Terrace Road and Connection Avenue as A1 Rural Restricted and R1 Low Density Single Family Residential City Initiated, our final consideration. Second. Motion is made and second. Ordinance 15-17, discussion. Those in favor of this ordinance signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Councilman Crawford. This is resolution number 24698 of intent to approve request for the use of tax increment financing from the Central Corridor Collins Road Extension Consolidated Urban Renewal Area for the construction of a facility located at 1204 7th Avenue, Marion, Iowa. This is Capital Commercial Division, LLC. Second. Motion is made and seconded for resolution 24698. Discussion? Uh, the developer is in attendance if the council has questions that you would like to ask that weren't covered in the uh, work session as well. I, I had a question. Yes. This is uh, at the end of the 10-year period, uh, you know, you were talking about changing changing the way the, the uh, everything is collected. At the end of the day, uh, where does the city stand on, on getting property taxes, money-wise, amount? You mean as far as the amount that it yes, was yielding right. versus what so it would the, yield? Will the change, will what was proposed change what the city gets at the end of the day? Um, no, it would actually increase the amount of property taxes because the uh, rebate would be smaller. The original agreement had a half million dollars worth of rebates, and the other one ha and the new one would have three hundred thousand dollars worth of rebates. And so, instead of taking five years to pay it off, it takes three and a half. So you've got that extra collections coming in. Uh, the other major difference too is that there's no money in the new agreement that would actually be forgiven. Um, it's all expected to be paid back, uh, other than the rebate portions and then uh, the on the front end of this uh, does that I mean we go from that what is it 500,000 rebate to 350 yeah uh, you go from 150,000 forgivable loan to 350,000 direct loan so it is heavier on the cash incentive portion of it the major difference is is that um, you're not essentially writing any of it off you're expecting it to be paid back I mean normally when you do uh, an economic development grant you expect to recover that from future property taxes uh, in this case we'd actually be getting paid back um, by the firm and directly that's, that's kind of what you were asking wasn't it Nick that about the, the forgivable, for forgivable portion of this, is that typical of what you've seen or of doing this type of thing? Or to have a forgivable portion? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not uncommon. Okay. I mean, there's several ways to do these, but that's not uncommon. Um, what's the current status of the project? What, or can we can we hear from Steve? I mean, what, when, when is the projected completion date? What's, what's the timeline? Good afternoon. What's Steve Stefani, 4361 Fox Meadow Drive, Southeast. Um, the projected date to turn over to the restaurant operators for build out is uh, uh, end of September, beginning of October. Uh, so the restaurant operator should be building out 
uh, during that time. The projected time to have the residences open and uh, available for uh, uh, occupation would be beginning of December. And they're actually going, both of those are going simultaneously right now. Of this year? Yes. Yes, we've got a lot of the kinks worked out. Is work like proceeding regularly now? Yes. I mean, it seems like well, it's been so done. intermittent that, you know, you never know what. Um, yeah, a lot of it has to do with production schedule or, you know, and when we get deliver product delivered, I think we just installed the windows uh, and doors on Thursday of last week. Um, the crews were working on some other, uh, a couple other projects that we had uh, yesterday and today. Uh, the um, there's interior concrete that's going to be done through the next seven days. Yeah, we've got to get some. We had to special order some brackets, so you're going to see the exterior work begin. Uh, additional exterior work will begin probably by the first of August. And, and what is? I mean, we, I don't even know that we've seen what the exterior will look like on this revised building. You know. The, Yes, and I can bring up. A we rendering. saw the three-story building, and it was, you know, changed. So, I think I showed a two-story rendering before, but I'd be happy to show it to you now if we. Yeah. If you have the time. I'd like to see it. Okay. One moment. That's going to require a little technical help. <laughs> Oh, you have it on the computer, Steve? Yeah. Okay. You, he's got it on the computer, Beth, so he'll need to. <laughs> I wish I had it printed out. Um, just go ahead and it's plug actually going to look almost identical to the three-story rendering, just minus a story. But the height of it, the end height, will actually be just a few feet shorter than the three-story, original three-story structure. And that's because we made the first story much higher taller ceilings. We have almost 16 foot ceilings in there. And the uh, residence levels with the um, with the roof. Oh, I wish you wouldn't have done that, Amanda, because then everyone can see. Don't switch that oh, over yet. Sorry. <laughs> well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I just, you're going to see me navigate, which if you not the best navigator. What happened there? She switched over to mine. Okay. Amanda broke it. <laughs> that was there. Did it automatically? What happened? What's happening? <sighs> Windows Explorer is not. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize. Um. Any other questions that I can answer in the meantime? Do you have this co uh, restaurant under contract? Yes, both restaurants. Both restaurants. Who are they? Uh, that has can changed. You, can you say? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, the local, uh, 1204, that's still Rem, or, um, uh, Lee Belfield's restaurant. He's the operator of Zins. He had been here before to yes, speak sir. to the council. Uh, that is the quote-unquote casual fine dining restaurant. Um, you know, we were intending to put a, uh, or have a bakery, Italian deli, right. um, and we were approached by the operator of the Riley's uh, restaurant chain, and uh, they um, were very eager to take over that front half of the, the building. So the front half would be a Riley's restaurant, the back half will be the, um, the local. 
So you have you have basically contracts with both. Have, we have build out contracts and uh, lease agreements. Very well. So that's actually where, in answer to the work session question, uh, Council Member Avalosley, when you were talking about the assessed value, the income, uh, the assessors will always use the income approach where they can. Uh, you know, I'm sure as you know. So in this case, the based on the projection of the lease agreements that we have with those two um, restaurant operators, and then the uh, projected rental revenue of the uh, residences in the second level, uh, then that would be closer to support the uh, $4 million assessed value of the building as a whole. Okay, but you, I mean, just so you understand, I mean, we're interested also, not just in the, in the assessed value, but in, you know, having a new, I mean, when, when, we're, when we're committing public money to a project, you know, we're also interested in having a new landmark for the citizens of Marion, something that they're, they can all be proud of, sure. something that they feel like they really got something out of investing in. Uh, you know, that's just as much my concern as how you are able to value the building so that you meet the requirements or whatever. I understand, uh, and I really believe that you'll, I just want to, I really believe, Okay, now I'm ready. You know, I mean, the, the, the taking it from three stories to two stories really disappointed me personally. Um, you know, even if you, I mean, though those same, I, I know you, you explained that it was, you know, something about market conditions and, uh, you know, that you didn't feel like you could um, lease out the uh, commercial, the office space, but, you know, um, you could have considered Two, store, two stories of residential, which I think there, there's a lot of consensus that, you know, more residential down here is, is good and needed. Um, you know, I would have liked to see a more substantial building. Well, you know, I, I appreciate that. I, again, I'm, I don't want to quibble with you, uh, although that the, the height of this building is actually not much shorter than the height of the original three-story building, just simply because of the the way everything had to work out. We're still going to, we will still have the rooftop garden slash event center. Um, that will still be there? Yes. Um, and, you know, that actually, uh, again, it's really going to be, uh, it'll be a great opportunity for the local to cater up there uh, for events. But as I think I've mentioned once before, it will be a real great feature for our residents because we're having, you know, built-in grill up there. They can go up and use it for grilling and so forth. And is there elevator access? The no. Roof? No, there's a stair. It's a lift lift system uh, for uh, mobility impaired. So what's a lift system? It's a lift that they can, a wheelchair can uh, ride up through, basically along the stairway. Oh, access. okay. So it that got approved as ADA compliant. Well, I'm sure. It just seems. I mean, some, you, you see that type of a system when you're trying to retrofit something that pre-existed, but not when you're putting in new construction. It's just. Uh, well, it, I think it's a little odd to see it, to not have a, have an elevator that can accommodate a new building. Uh, elevator consumed a lot of square footage interior. Yeah. Right? And uh, mm -hmm. so that was that was a, a big cost of it um, was that consumption of square footage. Our space is really we've we've tried to use the most out of this six thousand square foot footprint. Well, uh, nearly about sixty nine hundred square foot footprint, and and it's been a challenge. And uh, we've really um, we've gone into some materials and finishes. You know, there's a lot of window, a lot of uh, stone, uh, the stone city order is, is very substantial, but I mean, that's a lot of native limestone uh, that'll be there. And I, I, I believe that it's a, uh, it'll be a great feature. The back restaurant, as you can see, it's got the patio dining, we'll have a fireplace there. So I, I really think 
you know, the intent of this building from the outset was to create a landmark for the city of Marion and a destination. Well, the only drawback I really see is the parking. Well, or parking with, you know, I've, I've got agreements with Farmer State Bank and the, the church behind, what is that, the Presbyterian Church mm -hmm. for our valet parking because, you know, the, the entrance here on the That entrance there on the side <laughs> yeah. is, uh, that will be the valet. And if you look at the curb cut, you'll see how the curb was was designed okay. for that. And that'll be for the local. And, and the local, that's their business plan, is to have valet parking. Um, valet parking's great. And uh, so, you know, that, that's, a, you know, that's something that we've had to address from the outset. Yeah. <laughs> We've been, we're very encouraged on the, I tell you, our experience on the Owen Block building has really excited us as to the residential aspect of this building because, you know, we uh, sold out the Owen Block building even before the last unit had been renovated. Um, so, and it's remained at 100% occupied. Well, why didn't you put a third story of residential? It doesn't make sense to me. Well, they, it just, you know, the cost of this building is uh, ha because of certain factors that were beyond our control has exceeded what we really had thought um, and had estimated. Why? Well, we had a lot of uh, contaminated soil to remediate. We had some concrete issues. We had a lot of excavation issues. Uh, we it didn't, didn't wasn't part of the has it, weren't wasn't there TIF money received for that? For the remediation of the contaminated soil, that was part no, of the. We've not received money. any TIF money. I thought that was part of the. Wasn't there an initial payment? It's part of the initial is what we're reading. We oh, everything this. was all wrapped yeah. up in together into the total. We did not submit for that. Okay, so we, you haven't received any TIF money for school. Okay, well that's good to clear that up. There's okay. some kind of a gate between it and the doctor's old building next door, and I'm concerned about water runoff uh, from this building and the building next door. The building... They both go to the back, I assume. Yeah, this, the space between those two is now paved, so um, water won't, will no longer... Their, their basement situation is actually going to become, or I'm sure has become much better because now that's all concrete. It all runs... Uh, hmm. Well... If there's any that runs off the alley or off that little two and a half foot space, it would run into the alley and then down into the storm drain. But then, uh, and then our sump pump is consuming anything that uh, is coming subsurface. That's, that's three feet between them. Is that enough to service their building? Uh, yes, it's about two feet ten inches uh, at its narrowest, and about three feet three feet six inches at their end, and and it's. Yes, a person can get in there and and uh, maintain their their brick would be the one thing that they would I would think that they would want to maintain. So this is what the building's going to look like. We can count on that. Yes. Well, it's windows gonna, don't look like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> currently. Well, the windows you can you'll be able to see through them. But uh, you know those are depictions of windows. And by the end of the year, we'll be able to eat at the restaurant and people will be able to live upstairs. Assuming the build-outs by the restaurant operators go on schedule, I would think that they, are, they would be completed. I think Riley's is intending to be um, finished by December and Lee is expecting to be open by New Year's. And one more question. Previous, when the last time you were here, you said you would be here every month updating us. Mm -hmm. Where have you been? <laughs> we're a very small company. <laughs> and that was... Uh, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just going to... No, I understand. Things. And I I apologize that I haven't been here uh, each month. My time is just... I, it's been very, very difficult for me to, to come over. Yeah, but we're an investor in this building. Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, and
and we can certainly prepare to uh, to be here on a re regular basis. And I apologize that I think the last time I was here and was in um, I think it was in April, wasn't it? Any other questions? Yeah, I just had a question. This is more for Lon. Because um, you had said that we are, as far as construction timelines, we're working on that to make sure that that is included in this document, to make sure that that's followed. Um, I would like to see if this is possible to get in there, um, going off of Mr. Stefani's timeline, that the deadline for this be January 1, so that we don't have it continuing out for another couple years, um, as well as, and I don't know how this can be worded, what can be done, but some sort of penalty or repercussion for missing another deadline. Yeah, the way the original development agreement was worded, I mean, the deadline, after you pass the deadline, there just is no development agreement anymore. I mean, that's the way they're typically worded. If you want something different, uh, I would have to check with our attorney to see what they've used in the past. That's just usually what we have used. And I think that's fair, but I'd like to see it at January 1. I, just brainstorming, I don't mean to talk out of turn, but you're right. And in line with that, because one of the aspects of we've been talking about is the receipts, receivable loan. So there would be a default element to that. It wouldn't just expire. The last one just expired because we hadn't received anything in advance. We didn't ask for anything in advance because we were, you know, we were facing all these hurdles and we just thought it wasn't appropriate for us, for us to submit for that. Um, so yes, Lon and I can work together on that and I'll share that. Any other discussion? Or thank you. Do we need to table it then if we're going to look at that line? Mm -hmm. No, the, what you're doing here is just actually going ahead and, and uh, directing the staff to negotiate the development agreement. Uh, now I've heard from the council on the other items that you would like to have in there, so we'll make sure that they're incorporated into the next draft. And then the council will still have the ability then to see the development agreement and vote on that. But since we have the state mandated process that we have to go through, this is the formal kickoff for that. I think they just encountered so many problems with that building site uh, as far as the, the soil and the contamination and and the what the building next door and the basement the, you know, the basement and all and it, it uh, they were just unforeseen thing, things happen that's my profound statement for the night for resolution 24698, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Your Honor, I'd like to, uh, before I've had a conflict of interest on this and that no longer exists, and with that in mind, I will vote yes. Thank you. Councilman Nick Abalasili. So am I actually I'm, making I'm, this motion? I am number two here <laughs> on the yellow sheet. Yes. Oh, I'm looking at the pink sheet, sorry. Number two. <coughs> well, I'll read the motion, uh, which is resolution number 24699 to approve partial payment number two uh, to Capital Commercial LLC for renovations to property located at 1007th Avenue in an amount of $300,000. Second. Motion is made second for resolution 24699 discussion. I just had a question. Um, in the contract, to receive payment number two, were there supposed to be historic preservation tax credits? And has that happened? Have they received? received all those? No, the company has done the first phase, which is to um, establish eligibility from the building. Uh, I don't know if they've heard back on that section yet. Steve, you may ask him to provide an update on where they're at in that stage. Usually with something like that, you end up having to work with a consultant that speci uh, specifically works on those types of issues. It's a, a very paperwork intensive um, process to go through. The Steve Stefani, 4361 Fox Meadow Drive, Southeast. Um, the contract actually, or the development agreement 
doesn't actually require that we receive the tax credit. It requires that we develop the and renovate the project and consistent with its historic character and consistent so that we may submit in, in conjunction with the, uh, well, historic tax credits application, or in this case, who we work with is the Iowa State Historic Preservation Office. They are a, uh, they are the local, for lack of a better way to describe it, um, <coughs> element of the National Park Service who really is the, you know, the, the sage or, you know, the ultimate decision maker on the tax credits. Um, we've been working with, and so as Lon mentioned, the part one has been submitted and, you know, that process is completed. There's a part two process. That is where we submit the plans and the final plans and um, our objective for consideration. That is under review right now and there's some interchange between myself and uh, the Historic Preservation Office as to a couple of elements in that. Um, if I could show you a couple things that might help to clear up, and what I understand in conversations is that there's been some confusion because of things that we've done as we were underway. Now, admittedly, we went into the, the first step of our renovation of the project was to renovate the residential units. That didn't really require, you know, a lot of um, historical, there's not a lot of historically significant element to that renovation process. And it really was to make those uh, units marketable. Um, and we've been able to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I believe that we have residents that, you know, that seem to be very happy being there. The next element was to get down to the main floor or the, the street level. And uh, our first application was to re relocate the Smitty's Barbershop over to the 10th Street side. <coughs> and the, um, which we did. And then we, we were able, I worked with Shippo, the exterior of the, the Smitty's, this used to be a loading bay. So they didn't require us to do this as a, a loading bay. Um, and we ended up doing the same type of brick front that we have on the rest of the 10th Street side. Um, the next application, and this is the historical photo which we've submitted to the Historic Society or Historic Preservation Office. So as was mentioned, I think by Mr. Spinks, or Com Council Member Spinks, but Top pointing is going to be a, a big aspect of this. Um, and that we have to submit for testing for the mortar, which we've done. We've um, And so we're using the same mortar that was used in the late 1800s when this was originally built. The other key historically significant aspects of the building are the cornice, the, uh, the rooftop cornice, the windows, and then the... Um, what are they called? Uh, there's a special name that I just learned. The, uh, well, it's a signboard fascia cornice. And these currently are painted. And they were painted because uh, <laughs> my partner Jody didn't like the way they looked <laughs> as they were just plain. So while we're waiting for the cornices to come in, you know, she painted them so they looked a little better. Um, the other aspects of this is that we've begun some painting of the cast iron columns and these uh, in the lintel trims. Um, and we painted them in historically accurate colors. You know, obviously we don't have color photos of what the building looked like before. The lintels, uh, blue, the blue that was used is historically accurate and it's also, as a matter of fact, the same blue that um, Jeannie and Paul Matthews have used on their, on their building. We chose blue because we thought it looked better. Originally, we also used, uh, and the white was a, is a historically accurate color. They were using white back then. I don't see white on that building. I don't see everything that's painted white on this building now. I don't see it white in this picture. 
Well, how is it, that ex historically it's, accurate? It's difficult to. Well, I, I mean, I'm just asking the question. Okay, there's a question, but see, there's a difference between we don't have to duplicate that building, we just have to be historically accurate, and we are allowed under the historic preservation rules to make changes in color so long as those colors are historically representative of the time period. The colors that we're using are historically representative, and uh, you know, so that. And, uh, it doesn't look better. <laughs> well, sorry. I, you know, I guess I, I, I'm sorry that you don't like that. Uh, the, um, the columns we've actually received quite a bit of compliment over the appearance of the building. Um, I don't think it looks, you know, obviously that blue and the on the, oh signboard co cornice and the blue in the upper. You know, I don't like that, but obviously that's all going to be covered up by the, by the cornice. The cornice has been approved by the uh, historic, the rooftop cornice has been approved by the Historic Preservation Office. When it is received, which I believe is going to be in the first week of August, we are going to have to uh, build these parapets these to duplicate that. Uh, and our, our um, Carpenters will be uh, building those, and and that was agreed to by the preservation office. What, the what color will that be, Steve? I'm sorry. The corner. What color will that be? The per, the parapet things. These yeah. things. Well, the whole thing up the there. The cornice. The cornice. The cornice will be a limestone color. Okay. Um, and the parapets will be a complementary color to that. They're not going to be. I don't. You know. There may be some blue accent to that. I don't know. We'll have to. And that lower cornice, what color would that be? But I forget what you be called a it. So that's going to replace that blue ribbon that's up there now. Okay. The blue was honestly just there. She just thought it didn't look good. You know, while we're undergoing it, she I just. I do. I do like the railings. I'm not trying to be all negative here. I do like the railings but that you put up. Well then, with all due respect, <laughs> if we can keep working from the ground up, we're going to do okay. Um, but the uh, the big other, the other, okay. So the windows, I'm working with um, Lori Unick at the State Historic Preservation Office on the windows, and I believe that um, we've got a plan for the windows to have the, and they're they're not they're going to look just like that from the exterior. But our biggest problem with the windows was that on the interior, the previous owners had they'd taken those and made permanent ceilings on the inside. <coughs> so those are all headered and two by fours. And so it was a matter of working with them for a configuration on the inside of those windows so that it wasn't, so it still looked historically accurate from the outside and, you know, then didn't create huge structural problems for us on the inside. And the door? The door's getting moved to the um, to the corner. You know, the door, to me, was a no-brainer because it's pretty easy to see, and you see where the door was originally designed. The interesting thing with the door, you know, maybe this stuff gets me excited, but no, but see, those are actually two doors. Right. Originally. I was just noticing. And it's interesting that a nice lady had talked to me after the last meeting I was here in April, uh, and uh, had said that the reason that she understood that that door had been moved to the corner, or from the corner to the side, was that the winds from 10th Street and 7th Avenue, you know, always opened the doors, blew the doors open. Hmm. Um, so the Historic Preservation Office has agreed we don't have to put double doors like that. They'll go along with a single door with the transom because that again that was historically accurate and also we believe uh, that those doors are probably pretty pretty light wood with a light spring thing that may have been why they kept blowing open um, but the uh, so I think we've got you know that problem was solved too but so I don't expect to have the part two approval until honestly until probably late August, just the way that they go. But I mean, it's, we are working with it and it will be, I mean, it will be historically accurate. 
um, and it's on track to be historically accurate. It just, because of the stage that we're in right now, uh, when those cornices really get installed, that's gonna really be a big deal. I mean, that will, I think, help solve a lot of your anxiety. You've spent $2 million already? Uh, well, that includes uh, the uh, purchase of the land and, you know, of the property itself. Building, yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's, it, and we prepaid for the rooftop cornice and 50% of that uh, um, signboard cornice. There's prepayment on a good portion of the element of that door. So, you know, uh, our total cost, we'd only expect to barely be about a little under, maybe $300,000 over what we originally anticipated on it. And the bulk of the inside work is completed. We're preparing the, the former Smitty space is being built out for a medical office. Uh, we have a tenant for that. Um, so, and that, uh, there's been some cost in there, and I think Marsha actually included some of that cost in mm. in your in what she sent you. But um, that cost actually will be reimbursed to us by the the tenant. If you're doing a little survey, I am not uh, a great in flavor of the white either. Uh, I think I like the blue. Uh, I like the beige that you painted over the white up above better than the white down below. But that's just me. So well, the best part about paint is that we can change that. Yes. So we have to start. I'm sorry. I think I think the white is a little too stark. But again, that's just that's personal opinion. I can appreciate um, that. When you look at pictures of, of historic, they really there was some flamboyant stuff going on back then. You know, but. I think it's hard for us well, to, because we think of everything in black and white for eight, late 1800s, but they had yeah, some pretty. Yeah. Well, again, you know, the point to be made is this is, you know, we, we agreed to give assistance to this project because this is an iconic building for Marion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very important to us in the community that it be restored correctly and, and, and preserved. And, you know, this is what people see when they drive into our uptown. You know, it's pretty important to us. And we want it to be just as important to you. We take that very seriously, uh, Councilman. And, uh, you know, this is the gateway of Marion. And we've understood that from the get-go. And I really think the, again, the cornice, when that's installed, is going to be a, uh, I mean, a great feature to that. Um, and that's why it's also very important to us to restore those windows to their original um, appearance. And I really think a lot of this anxiety could have been avoided with more frequent visits. I, I will be here every other week. Um, uh, sure. well, so what, what's, what's the timeline? I know you said well, August you're going to get the cornices. Yeah, actually the timeline on this one um, we expect we expect to be finished by completed with our portion and actually the medical office may be completed with their build out at the same time because they can start doing their build out what well, we've already started their build out. I think this will be done a two months, oh, I'm going to say a month and a half to two months ahead of schedule. Which is? December 31. December was the. Right. We actually That's with the tuck pointing and everything? Yes, the tuck point, well the tuck point is going to take about six weeks but that can go simultaneously with a lot of this other stuff. Yeah. So it's actually, you know, the, the relocation of the door, we've got, we expect to start doing that in August and that's going to take a lot of coordination with the, the operators of the Maidrite. And it's still the plan to keep Maidrite, that the Maidrite will still be in that spot? Or Been there for 26 years. Yeah, no, I'm just curious, yeah. But, you know, we expect to brighten the place up a little bit. And what does happen with the mage right while you're working in there? Well, that's what we got to coordinate with them. Oh, okay. There, it, potentially, it's, it's uh, you know, and I, I probably need to sit, we'll be sitting down with Terry and Nicole and um, 
you know, potentially they could continue to operate, sort of a pardon iron mess type situation. I think their clientele is so locally based and so entrenched that I'm not sure it would really disrupt a lot. You know, I mean, I don't think it would disrupt the majority of their patrons. They probably would enjoy seeing what's going on. Our big deal would be keeping them safe. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of concerns that I want to address, I guess, and hopefully you can help me with these. The first one is the entire reason that the city agreed with this TIF, that the council went along with it, is because really to restore this, it's not economically viable. You're not going to get the assessment. That's why we decided to stand behind it with the idea that this building was going to be restored to its true historical context. What you're telling me is that you are going to restore it to the time frame, not to the building, which is a major concern of mine. You're, you're living in the gray area of the National Historic Society, saying that this color is true to that time period, probably not to this building. You're saying the same thing for the doors. Um, that I take issue with because you are changing the building. That building doesn't have color. Um, it doesn't have paint on it. That's a major concern of mine. I don't feel like you're living up to the obligation that you came to us with because of that. My other concern is um, the dollars that have been spent, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't sound like they've been spent towards the historical reconstruction. They sound like they've been spent towards the purchase of the property, obviously, and then redoing the buildings. I have a hard time, yeah, the apartment, excuse me. I have a hard time giving city dollars to a project that hasn't actually done what the city put money in for. And I understand the letter of the agreement says half of the receipts, but you haven't spent those receipts on what the city wanted to be involved in. Well, I believe we have. I believe those payments were scheduled, they're actually structured on $350,000 increments. Um, and one of the other aspects of that our agreement with the city was not only to restore it historically, but also to make it a, a economically viable building. When we took that building over, um, it had it had the made right tenant, it had Smitty's, and it had two of the seven residences leased. And uh, it was, its electrical, electrical was in horrible disrepair. In fact, it created a fire in November of last year. Um, we now have electrical and HVAC uh, in the, and plumbing in the residence levels and they are 100% occupied, receiving twice as much for the rent than uh, what the two tenants were paying before. We also have uh, three occupied commercial spaces and we have another commercial space that is, we have a lease for, for a medical office. As it relates to the paint, unfortunately, council member, I, I have to tell you that what you're seeing, the brick is brick color. But these cast iron posts, that is actually a very drab olive paint on there. It then was painted with lime green. And then it was painted, uh, there was a baby blue, and then it was painted black. We took off four layers of paint on those cast iron posts. So there, that is paint that you see there. There that has been paint on that building. What's that? They said there has been paint on that building in the last 150 years. No, we, we believe the original coat of paint painted. was olive, was a very drab olive, and we chose not a bright white or a bright blue. No, but we chose to we chose, as we are allowed under the historic, you know, things to make that a a, a design feature. The that's, um, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. That is not what this building was. You are living in the gray area of the National Historic Guidelines. The way that I voted when I initially looked at this was this was going to be restored to what this building was, not to what some buildings of that time frame were. And that is where I don't feel like you are living up to your end of the bargain. Well, I believe, I, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. I believe that, that what we've done to enhance that building and how we've made it a viable, much more vibrant member of this commercial community, I think, is you know, we should also be given credit for that. And if you've got full occupancy, I give you credit for that. 
I do not give you credit for the historical end of it, which is what I'm referring to. I understand. Excuse me, but he, I've been involved with the National Trust for Historic Preservation for a number of years. And when you go in to do this, you try to find photos that are representative of that particular building, dwelling, whatever. And so few of them are in color. But then you have the ones, uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas is a perfect example uh, of what is done according to their historic preservation. And they've got painted ladies all over the place. And you cannot paint or do anything unless you get their approval. And that is obviously a black and white photo, and you're not going to see color on it. So I don't see what the problem is. Joe? Oh, I, you know, I'm with them. Not why I, well, I don't particularly like the white. I think as what I voted for when to do it, when we did this, was to preserve the building, and uh, otherwise the building would be gone in a few years, I believe. So I guess I... I feel like that's what you've done. You have preserved the building. You may not like the color, but you have preserved the building. And then, uh, Mary Lou, I had a question for you. Is that your... I wasn't here then. It, was <laughs> that your vehicle, or is that Kay Lammers up on the left up oh, there? it's going to be a real... <laughs> see, <laughs> see, structure wise foundation, <laughs> there, I mean, what, has anything been done, or is there any plans? I know well, like. <laughs> yes, in the basement. I mean, we had... we And we're still under... still doing some stuff in the um, north part of the original basement to, um, it wasn't structurally unsound, but, you know, there's some stuff in there, there's leakage, and, you know, we're getting some, there's some water issues, so that's being all short. I've always heard that, that water comes in, so I mean, is, is yeah. that being <laughs> yeah. taken care of? It's been taken care of so that water doesn't r gush in like it did, but, but there's more work to be done. But in the end, it's not going to be just a temporary fix. It's going to actually... No, there's actually going to be a bit... We have a business application in there uh, for that, believe it or not. A, um, a what? A business application? Another bowling alley? No. Um, I feel safe in telling you because we're about... Uh, but I, a root beer bar. <laughs> and uh, you know how we have... Um, there, we have a, an individual restaurant operator, another restaurant operator, that um, you know how you have microbreweries for beer? This would be essentially like a microbrewery for root beer. And uh, we think, it, and then I'd like to have, you know, I've been pushing from day one to have a little um, 10 pins bowling huh. alley down there because there used to be one down there, believe it or not. And uh, so cool. I think that'd be a great place for families, kids to come, you know, on, on nights. But anyway, so that's, that will, uh, that will be the uh, application. So that's what's going to go down there. So it's got to be water tank. There's also a tunnel down there, believe it or not, to uh, that goes under under Seventh uh, Avenue. To to where? We believe to the railroad station. Oh, we haven't gone in the tunnel. It's been blocked off. But I mean, yeah, it's kind of neat. So um, I'm, I may have missed or or didn't hear it correctly, but the tell me the windows again. Um, they're going to be restored like that? I mean, the, aren't the, yes. current, the current windows are not that size, right? No, they're not. They were furred in. So, but they're going to be yep. larger windows like this? That full size, yes. When is that going to be done? That'll be through the next, well, I would imagine by Labor Day that'll be completed, but it's they're scheduled for delivery in uh, mid-August. Mid-August, okay. Any other discussion? Thank you. Lon, I have a question. Yeah. Um, we're, we're here to approve a partial payment number two, and this partial payment um, does um, uh, in, in, uh, consider a historical preservation um, credit 
or is, is, what, what would you call? Yeah, it, uh, it basically the um, agreement was predicated on the idea that they would complete a project that um, met the standards to be eligible for a historic preservation tax credit. They did not have to receive one, but that it would need to meet the Department of the Interior standards for historic preservation projects. And, and the bottom line is, has that happened? It has not yet. Um, the uh, According to Mr. Stefani, they're at stage two in the process for um, completing that. Uh, essentially, the way that the agreement works is, you know, even if you, if the council approves this um, and they don't achieve that standard, then they've defaulted on the loan and it becomes repayable. It's not forgivable. Um, the loan is set up to be forgiven and it takes a period, I believe, of six years for the loan to be forgiven after the project is completed. So at any point during that, um, if they were default on it, the city can seek to have the money paid back. How? It would be just like any other regular loan default. You'd have to collect it the same manner that a bank would. Well, why, why wouldn't we wait another couple months till this uh, historical preservation is met? Obviously, in the next couple months, there's going to be a lot of lot of things done. Sounds yeah, like the it. council has the option of doing that, of course. I mean, that's entirely up to you when you approve the payment. But uh, at this point, you know, the... The contract, as it was written, stipulated that we would put the payments in um, as spending thresholds were reached, and so they did have the ability to request that payment based on those spending thresholds being met. And 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 the historical preservation was not part of of that. They're tied together, but um, I mean, most of the time you're. If you're doing a conventional loan, they're going to be doing disbursements into the project before it's complete. That's something that would have to be completed with the completion of the project. So I think what Lon is saying is that while the requirement to, I mean the actual language says, to be true to the historic character of the building and meet the standards necessary for historic preservation tax credit, that while that's an obligation in the agreement, it's not necessarily, the payments aren't necessarily tied to that obligation in terms of when the payments are made. Right, the, what's tied to that is the forgiveness of the loan. Good explanation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there any other discussion? So, Lon, is it your recommendation that the, there's this, this agreement is being complied with? At this point, I think the agreement um, is being complied with. If we get a determination back from the State Historical Society that they're disallowing some of the items, that's something that we'll have to contend with. Uh, there is still um, going to be another 100000 though that's due um, or could eventually be due under this agreement that the council will not have paid out. So you still have that as well. Very well. Very well. Any other discussion? Very well. We'll have a vote. Let's have a roll call vote, please. Ms. Pazur? Yes. Ms. Etzel? Yes. Mr. Spinks? Yes. Mayor Busca? Yes. Mr. Crawford? No. Mr. Abawasli? Yes. Mr. Draper? Yes. Passes six to one. Thank you. Councilman Draper? Yes, Your Honor. I move approval of resolution 24,700, approving server upgrades and backup service for City Hall and server backup and service for the police station in the amount not to exceed $162,885.07. Second. Motion is made and second for resolution 24700 discussion. Uh, Mayor, this was not something that we really discussed during the work session, but essentially what um, Terrell has done in the IT department is taken a look at the cost of doing server upgrades at City Hall and replacing uh, our equipment that's reaching its end of life versus contracting with someone else to provide that equipment. Uh, and looking at the five-year costs for maintaining our own versus contracting, um, he's recommending that we actually use the services of Involta. So uh, the server room at City Hall will eventually look a lot more bare. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to us for doing that, um, primarily uh, being that um, there's no way we could afford the level of equipment or the type of equipment that Involta has out there, nor the level of security that they have for their equipment. So I just wanted to give you an overview. It is a budgeted expense. Um, we have to replace equipment and have to have those backup contracts, but he's determined that uh, this should save us around $30,000 over that five years. Yes, I understand. He's done a very nice job. Thank you, sir. I, I, uh, he's uh, he's on top of this. That's good man. So, so the only servers that we will maintain then will be at the police station with Involta as the backup. Right. 
I think the main thing is the security level. Very well. Any other discussion? Oh, well, I guess one question. If, if the police servers go down, uh, will they have as quick of access to uh, the data? Or is that won't inhibit that's, their... That's one of the benefits of being at Involta with the backup as a service. It's not only backup, it's actually replicating live. <clears throat> so if they were to go down, let's say the entire police station were hit by a tornado, building's gone, we could we could just fire those servers up in Involta, run off of there. They're already really fired up there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, if Involta would lo lose them, the, the backups are also there. Um, so we could just operate... If anywhere we, we have internet connection, we could I was gonna say so. that would that would put the police station anywhere you had city service, is yep. that correct? Yep, and same with this building was taken out by a tornado. We don't have to worry about losing that data, rebuilding that. And Volta's supposed to be able to withstand 160 mile an hour winds. They've got huge backup generators, so there's a lot so more. So this 163,000, mm -hmm. does that include the agreement with Volta then? Yep, so, so this is actually for a three year agreement. Three year And agreement. that's kind of to our benefit. We were looking at five year costs because that's the way servers, hard physical mm -hmm. servers are compared. Um, but the, they do a standard three year agreement. I like that because the price of cloud service is actually going down, not going up. So there's a good chance we'd, we'd actually spend less on year four and five. No guarantee of that, but that's that's the way the market's trending. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yep. Any others? For resolution 24700, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Councilman Pazor. Your Honor, I move to concur with the Lost Committee determination that use of lost dollars for hotel motel market study is consistent with the ballot language and allocate up to $25,000 for that purpose. Second. Which is made in second to concur with the Lost Committee. Discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Councilman Itzel. Motion directing staff to execute contract with Hospitality Marketers International for completion of a hotel motel market study in an amount not to exceed 16500 Second. Motion is made in second. Uh, discussion? Was there any other bidders on this or this was the only one? That yeah, this was the only one that submitted a bid when I had uh, contacted firms trying to get some budgetary numbers for this. Um, a very basic study without the before and after with Prospect Meadows generally runs around 12000 and uh, the other ones had costs ranging up to 25000 It seemed so. like you talked about this during the budget meeting mm -hmm. during this. Is this consistent with that? Yes. The budget line item money amount? Yep, the twenty-five thousand was the budget line item okay. for that. So we're eighty-five hundred below. Okay. So All right. So so we'll uh, we'll uh, execute this contract, and w then we find out yes, we do, we don't, whatever about a hotel motel. Who uses that information and who promulgates it? The city will have the information, but it would be, as a public document, it would be available for use by any of our partner groups. Uh, the CVB could use it, the Chamber of Commerce, Medco could use it, um, developers who are seeking to bring a hotel to Marion could use it. Um, I think it's fair to say that one of the things that uh, the committee did like about it was the fact that it was going to be our document and we would have the ability to um, be involved with its use. Okay, thank you. Is that a fair characterization, Dwight, you think? Thank you. For this motion, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And uh, Your Honor, I move to approve a mayoral appointment, Noel Kurt, uh, for the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Second. Uh, this mo motion is made second. Uh, I, I have a comment here. Is this individual here? No? Um, um, I don't know this individual, so I. I mean, this this uh, this appointment appeared uh, tonight. Uh, I don't know who it is. I'm sure it's a good person, but um, uh, I should like to be able to say that I know these people before I appoint them. But uh, do these have terms, uh, term limits? Or? I, 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 don't, I, I don't think they right offhand. I don't. I don't think they do. I think they just. No, appointed. it's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But uh, for for this uh, for this appointment uh, to the uh, bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Uh, council discussion. 
Your Honor, I have one item, and I know that this is not going to be a very pleasant item to talk about, but I have received many phone calls, and quite a few of them were very irate. The photo that appeared in the Marion Times with the city manager and the assistant city manager accepting that health wellness thing from the governor, uh, the problem seems to be that they felt that the mayor should have been receiving it. And I guess I would like to know, okay, why not? I saw it, I can give them an answer back. I don't have an answer of them, I do. But, you know, I, I was I was fine. Did you know in advance about it? Uh, yeah, I knew the day before, I think, wasn't it? Wasn't it the day before? Yeah, we were instructed that we were supposed to keep that uh, very close to the vest, that um, the governor's office wanted to control the release of information on that, so they were um, very particular about um, when we were able to tell people. Well, because I, well, that's kind of crappy because, uh, <laughs> I mean, gee whiz. Uh, well, we are the ruling body of this city, and the, 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 once again, where's the transparency, and especially within this, and I've had somebody said, okay, don't talk about it. I don't think anybody would have, but I, and like I said, they're very irate that it should have been the mayor that was accepting it. Well, I appreciate your concern. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, saw where the, I think it was Station 2, has hail damage on the roof. Is there any other buildings, city buildings, that are have been evaluated? There? That's going to be uh, determined next week. Hopefully next week we'll have somebody out to make sure. But I'm, I'm saying in general, has the city looked at, you know, looked at their buildings, you know, like the flower and... Yes, Joe, we did look at all our facilities within the parks. We did have some uh, minor hail damage out at the swimming uh, pool above the, the, the filter room out there. It's a fiberglass uh, ceiling in there, and we did have a couple spots where we did uh, have hail damage, um, very minor, and we actually patched it with our staff. Yeah, we had a probably a baseball size one in our front yard that morning. <laughs> it was a... Uh, we didn't have any. Huh? I didn't have any. You didn't? No. In North North Marion was huh? that's where most of it was. So. Station two also had a baseball size. Did they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it hit the house and I thought, man, that's coming through. So anyway, you know, don't make sure that's inspected. It's being evaluated. Yeah. I'm glad you guys weren't out out in it. Ooh. Hey. Oh. <laughs> well, Chief, looks like you got your work cut out for you <laughs> on the eligibility list for fire. It was, was a yeah. pretty good size. One other thing I had is I'd like to uh, say I thought a, a morning paper card and article is $75,000 coming for the county for the alley, and I think that's a really big boost. And I appreciate their effort in that. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, I, I, I thought... I have a comment uh, about the flags. Uh, you know, we spent, uh, the city spent uh, 16000 towards uh, 20, 24, 25000 for banners. banners. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, I, we had four, four businesses on their own that put their flags out. I, you know, are the others waiting for the city to put flags out in front of them for them or whatever? I thought, my gosh, uh, we, we, spent, uh, we spent all this money. We, I hate to spend it all on flags, but gosh, it, you know, it was, it was devoid during uh, uh, Memorial Day, Flag Day, and Fourth of July. No flags in our downtown. I think, uh, I think we can do a lot better than that. Like the Optimist are the ones that put out the ones on the, well, they put one in my front yard. And the little ones? Yeah. Yeah, up and down. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. I think there's a real city that does something like that, too. But anyway, I think that's something we should look at. I mean, we should really put our flags out. We've got, we've got them on poles. Don't we have flag stands on the poles for small flags? So I think we should look into that. Anyway, that's all. Uh, are we going to private session? Yeah.
I just had uh, one reminder, Mayor, that um, we had sent out a notice to the council about uh, the Blue Zones project certification team coming in, and they're going to want to meet with the uh, council members um, to talk about um, how the project went and just ask some questions as part of that certification process. I know we've heard back from two council members indicating that they'd be available, but we really need to make sure we've got as many hands on deck as we can for that. Very well. 10 o'clock was pretty early for a retiree. <laughs> On a Saturday, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we may adjourn, adjourn to a private session, sir. Very well. Thank you.